Uh, welcome back to Revelation for the rest of us. I uh, hope you're enjoying this study as uh, much as I am. Uh, we've been uh, learning a lot of exciting things about uh, uh, how to gain perspective in the world we live in. I'm sure that was important to that uh, very first audience that John wrote to. Uh, we've been learning some uh, powerful things about what to expect in our world, but also powerful things about how we as Christians uh, need to maintain uh, not only our perspective, but our enthusiasm for Christ and our uh, strong dedication uh, to be faithful to Christ until the end. And we know that if we are, according to Revelation, we're going to receive some unparalleled rewards for all of eternity. So I hope you're excited about tonight's lesson. This is lesson six in our series of Revelation for the rest of us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen with you at uh, this point, <clears throat> and uh, we'll go ahead and get started uh, in Revelation uh, chapter 15. Uh, interestingly, uh, we have seen in Revelation to this point that John has introduced us to seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven significant signs, and now, as you might expect, seven bowls of wrath. Now, what we've seen prior to this section is that each one of those surveys the entire church age right up till the coming of Christ or the day of judgment. And uh, then uh, as we proceed to a new section, it goes back and does the same thing, surveys the entire church age leading up to the coming of Christ. Uh, because that's uh, been John's pattern to this point, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that that's what he's going to do in this section of Revelation, where John uh, tells us about the, se <clears throat> excuse me, the seven bowls of wrath. In Revelation 15, 16, uh, we are uh, introduced to the fact that God is going to pour out his wrath on planet Earth during the church age. Uh, in Revelation 15, 1, John says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. As we read through this chapter, we're going to begin to understand that the idea of completed here means executed. God is not an absentee God. God is on the job through the entire church age, including our own day. And it may appear a lot of times that the sinful man just gets away with it, but that's not true. They face God's judgments in the historical process leading up to the final judgment of God when Christ returns. Now, chapter 15 is a very short chapter, and it introduces us to uh, the bowls being poured out or I mean it's uh, introducing us to the fact that they're ready to be poured out, and we'll read about that in chapter 17 or 16. Uh, but because this is such a short chapter, I want to read the entire 15th uh, chapter. John says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image, and over the number of its uh, name. They held harps given them by God, and sang the song of Moses. Uh, well, sang uh, the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And here are the lyrics to the song. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and I saw in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. 
out of the temple came seven angels with seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. What an interesting picture that John paints for us as he introduces the fact that during the church age, uh, the bulls of God's wrath are going to be executed uh, in our world. Now, in this introduction, uh, we noted that uh, there were seven angels uh, who uh, have seven last plagues, and those plagues are contained in seven bowls of wrath that will be poured out on the earth. That's the picture. This picture is uh, God's intense anger of man's sin. Uh, I just don't believe that uh, we, can, we can overstate that. God is angry at human rebellion and human sin, and uh, he has every right to be, uh, to think that the puny little people like us would stand up and resist his righteousness. Uh, well, it's just unthinkable, and God is angry at man's sin. Now, we're told uh, how he is going to deal with that through the historical process is he is going to pour out the bowls of wrath. God is going to execute, you know, that is complete his anger during the church age by uh, allowing people to experience these bowls of wrath. And what we're going to find by the time we're done is the one, one person's trumpet of warning is another person's encounter with a bowl of God's wrath. Remember the trumpets of warning? Because we're Christians, we recognize that. When tragedy or hardship comes to other people, we can look at that and think, oh, wow, I heard the trumpet. Today, that happened to that person. Tomorrow, it might be me. I need to make sure that I'm right with God. But when it comes to the bowls of wrath being poured out, that's no longer a trumpet of warning. Anyone who experiences these tragedies means uh, that uh, their life has come to an end, and they have no more opportunity to be right with God. They have experienced in the historical process uh, a, a judgment of God or the wrath of God. Now, during this time, during the church age, uh, Revelation describes uh, Christians, you know, those who are not going to be the recipients of the bowls of wrath. They are described in uh, chapter 15, verse 2, as those standing beside the sea. We saw earlier in Revelation that the sea generally represents uh, a humanity at large. Well, the church is standing beside the sea. We come out of the world, and we no longer share the world's uh, uh, values, uh, its mission, its wants, its desires. Uh, we've been set apart for the purpose of Christ. And secondly, during the entire church age, Christians will be those who are victorious over the beast, his image, and his number. Uh, you will recall that the beast of Revelation represents anti-Christian government in uh, opposition uh, to uh, the cause of Christ. Uh, the image of that uh, of world government, <clears throat> you may recall that uh, it is pictured as having 10 heads and one head was uh, had received a fatal blow and uh, yet had come back to life. There's always this fascination about world government. That's the image that uh, people attach to. And they think that the next king or the next president or the next government is going to bring the solution to our problems, and it just uh, never happens. And Christians are described as those who are victorious over his number. You may re uh, remember that the number of the beast is 666. Failure after failure after failure, a falling short of God's glory, 
on top of a falling short, on top of a falling short. John is reminding us that Christians will recognize that any human endeavor at the end of the day is going to fall short of the glory of God. So we must not allow uh, ourselves to be pressured into giving in uh, to the values and the beliefs of the world. Now, we're also told that during the church age, as the bowls are about to be poured out or will be poured out, uh, Christians are blessed. Uh, we're told in uh, 15, 2 through 4, first of all, uh, Christians are given harps by God. You know, that's a powerful image of, uh, of happiness. We break out in song because of uh, the wonderful blessings that we're receiving from God. And uh, we're told they sing the victory song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Uh, I want you to notice uh, the imagery there. Uh, the song of Moses, the servant of God, uh, suggests that uh, those celebrating are God's old covenant people. And the song of the Lamb represents his new covenant people. So all of God's people during the church age, both on earth and in heaven, are going to join together in uh, singing the victory of Christ uh, over the beast and his image uh, and uh, ultimately over Satan. Now, the lyrics of that tune are given to us. I think this is great. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have any uh, contemporary Christian artists who have put this to music. I know there are a lot of scripture songs out there. But this is one I would hope that a Christian artist would just take verbatim and uh, find the right tune to present that to us in a glorious way. But here is what the church sings during the church age when the bowls of wrath are being poured out. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. If uh, we are uh, uh, have a dynamic relationship with the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we live a life of celebration regardless of uh, some of the things that uh, may be a challenging to us or some of the things we see in our world we don't like. We live a life of celebration because of the work of Christ. Now, <clears throat> John goes on in chapter 16 to describe the bowls of God's wrath actually being poured out on earth in the historical process. Uh, at this point, I'm going to trust that you've already read chapter 16, and if not, you might want to pause the video here to read it, um, and we're going to review some of the key points of this chapter. One of the things that John does throughout this chapter is identify who receives God's wrath in the historical process during the church age? Well, first of all, those who have the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. Uh, you may recall uh, that these marks in Revelation are spiritual marks that God sees. Someone who has the mark of the beast is someone who is using his hands to serve anti-Christian government or a false religion and philosophy. Has, if someone has the mark on his forehead, that means they're using their mind to support anti-Christian uh, government or false religion and false philosophy. Those who live their lives wearing those spiritual marks are going to receive God's wrath. Secondly, John said, those who see or those who shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. You know, one of the tragic things about life until Jesus comes is that uh, God's people are going to suffer martyrdom uh, in many places in our world, as we have documented in uh, some earlier lessons. Uh, there are Christians every day who are being put to death simply because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, those who do those kind of things, who kill uh, believers, uh, they're not getting away with it. Uh, 
Uh, it might seem like they are for the moment, but they're not getting away with it. They're going to receive the bowl of God's wrath. And then in uh, Revelation 16, 9, and 11, those who continue to curse God and refuse to repent are going to receive God's bowls of wrath, experience his anger. Uh, you know, one of the things about the tragedies and the difficult times that show up on earth, they give us wonderful opportunities to take some inventory and to turn our life around. That's what the trumpets of warning were all about that Christians recognize. But for those who don't recognize the trumpets, uh, we need to understand that they are going to experience a bowl of God's wrath. And they're no, no, uh, regardless of whether life is good or whether life is difficult for them, they're going to continue to curse God and going to continue to repent and do his will. And as a result, they're going to be the recipients of uh, God's wrath. <clears throat> so how does God's wrath show up in the historical process? Well, uh, uh, John's vision explains this very clearly. Uh, uh, you know, those who don't follow God are going to uh, uh, experience ugly and painful sores. That's just an image of uh, any kind of health and physical difficulties. Uh, they will experience death at sea, death from pollution, scorching, unbearable heat, uh, the beast uh, kingdom will be darkened. That's just an image of the failure of world government to deliver its promises. And uh, finally, uh, they're going to be subject to demonic influence and demonic control, uh, leading up uh, ultimately till the day when uh, mankind offers its final resistance and uh, we are introduced to uh, the Battle of Armageddon that uh, we'll talk about shortly. Now, many of the things that we've just talked about came up earlier in Revelation when we talked about the trumpets of warning. See, for the Christian, all of these tragic things are just that. They are trumpets of warning. And if any of them happen to us, it's not a bowl of wrath. Uh, the wind of destruction can blow on us, but it blows us right up to heaven. But for the unbeliever, these are bowls of God's wrath his judgments in the historical process in such a way that when they die, their fate is sealed. Uh, they simply don't get a second chance. Now, through the first six bowls, uh, John uh, paints a picture of the world leading to uh, a uh, moment called Armageddon. Uh, the seventh seal, we'll have more to say about that, but uh, many believe that the armies of the world uh, will gather at a place called Armageddon in Israel for World War III, and it will be the consummate land and air war. It's going to, uh, there will be ultimate modern, uh, ultra modern weapon, uh, strategic nuclear arms, and the nations of the whole world are going to assemble there for battle. Well, the word Armageddon in Hebrew means the mountain of Megiddo. And geographically, there is no mountain at Megiddo. So this is another example where John is clearly using a symbolic name. He's not thinking literally. You know, John's picture of global troops is simply a graphic symbol of the greater spiritual war that goes on between the forces of evil and the forces of God. Armageddon isn't a land war, it's a spiritual war, and that moment in history at the end of time will be when mankind offers its final resistance to the lordship of Christ. That's what's coming down the pike in Armageddon. Now, as God gets, uh, as God pours out these uh, bowls of wrath, and as uh, he prepares to uh, pour out the final bowl, the seventh bowl, once again, John kind of backs up and says, okay, what's going on with Christians uh, during uh, this time? When these things happen in the historical process or the church age, what's going on? 
Well, Christians are described in the 1615 as those who stay awake. In other words, we remain spiritually alert to uh, what Christ wants us to do, wants us to know. Christians are those who remain clothed. Uh, we will find uh, uh, later in Revelation that that's an image for righteous acts. Uh, Christians are those uh, living in an unrighteous world are going to be the people who do the righteous things, the right things that please God. Christians are described as those not found naked. In other words, we are not going to give in to the world's precious uh, uh, pressure to plunge into uh, unrighteous living. And uh, Christians are described as those not shamefully exposed. You know, we need to understand that we can't hide our evil acts from the Lord. Well, Christians do understand that. Uh, but those who are not committed to Christ, regrettably because of their unrighteous living, will find that the Lord has been seeing everything they've been doing uh, to their shame. And God also blesses the church. Again, the same pattern where John describes Christians and then reminds us of how God is going to bless us, why it's worth not giving in to the world and its pressures. In verse 15, the church receives a personal message from the Lord Jesus Christ, giving us understanding and instruction. I just think that that is so cool. In this vision, the Lord himself breaks in, and he kind of puts us, you know, pats us on the back, uh, uh, pulls a chair in front of us and says, let me have uh, this, uh, this comforting talk with you. And so he speaks directly to the church. Uh, his coming, uh, he tells us that his coming will be unexpected. Uh, but in contrast to the world, we should be ready. We, we should be expecting that. And uh, we should be dressed in our righteous acts. So it's great that the Lord gives us that uh, encouragement uh, to be prepared for his coming. So we can summarize the pouring out of the first six bowls uh, in this way. During the church age, God is not an absentee God. He's not just waiting till the end. He displays his anger at sinful people, and they are punished. When someone receives a bowl of wrath and does not repent, God's judgment is final. There is no second chance. In other words, his wrath has been completed on that person until the day of judgment. Now, a bowl of wrath upon sinners is actually a trumpet of warning for believers. Those who stand strong against the beasts of anti-Christian government and false religion and philosophy, who wear the spiritual mark of Christ by serving him with our hands and minds and worshiping him, and who stay ready for his coming, they are the ones who are going to be blessed and come out favorable in the day of judgment. Uh, what a, an encouraging and powerful series of images for that uh, first century group of Christians who were undergoing persecution. Uh, you know, uh, the beast of uh, anti-Christian government and false religion and philosophy was applying great pressure to them to give in. And uh, John is, uh, Christ through John is giving those Christians this steady dose of encouragement to remain faithful because it's definitely going to be worth it. <clears throat> Well, that leads us to the seventh bowl, and God's wrath is poured out. And uh, in the imagery of this particular uh, uh, bowl, once again, Revelation reveals what will happen during the entire church age, but now he is leading us up to the final judgment of God. That is the message of bowl seven. At the end of the church age, we come to the final judgment of God. And uh, 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 Revelation shouts out loud and clear, it is done. So as this bowl is poured out, uh, the Lord identifies who's going to be on the receiving end of God's wrath. 
First of all, Revelation says Babylon, the great cities of the world, and those are just images of civilized man in opposition to God. Any, anyone who is plugged in to civilization and opposition to God is uh, going to uh, regrettably receive God's ultimate wrath. And then those who persist in cursing God. As noted earlier in this lesson, uh, the uh, tragic and difficult things of this life uh, give ample opportunity for people to do some reflection. Even the blessings of this life do that. Someone ought to stop and think, well, where are these blessings coming from? Uh, but after you've walked through life and you persist in cursing God, uh, that person is going to be the one who is on the receiving end of the seventh bowl of wrath. So how does God's final judgment come upon sinful man? He has been executing his judgments throughout history, but the ultimate judgment comes at the end. Well, his judgment will be instantaneous. Uh, Revelation 16, 17 simply says, it is done. Nothing man can do about it. It is done. It's going to come powerfully. Uh, the imagery of Revelation, uh, uh, when God says it is done, there is lightning and thunder and a huge earthquake like no one has ever seen, huge hailstones, the way a uh, hundred pounds falling on people. All of these are images of the tremendous power of God's judgment. It is a foreboding thing to think about, you know, those who may experience that. But this is also a continuing wake-up call for us Christians. We don't want to find ourselves in this situation. And when uh, God's final judgment comes, it comes completely. Uh, Revelation says the cup is filled with the fury of God's wrath. There will be no holding it back. And those who have resisted God all of their life will spend an eternity in crisis. So what are the big lessons we can learn from the bowls of wrath? Well, we need to understand God is there, and he will not tolerate rebellion indefinitely in this life or the life to come. So the message, Christians, uh, be ready. And we need to live our lives righteously in such a way that we're ready for Christ to come at any time. The, the message we need to share with unbelievers is unbelievers repent. If you're still alive, it's, uh, it's not too late to turn around and find Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. Uh, what a great uh, uh, lesson that we came to in, in chapters 15 and 16. Now, our next lesson next week is going to be uh, chapters uh, uh, 17 and 18, and uh, man, we're moving in rapidly toward the end of Revelation, and it continues to be exciting, so I want to encourage you to read ahead, uh, but in the meantime, let's just thank the Lord that he has given this information about how to understand our world and as Christians, how we need to uh, uh, stay encouraged to be faithful and obedient to Christ. Uh, God bless, and uh, uh, we'll see you next lesson. And again, I hope you're looking with great anticipation toward that. Take care.